And if you would, open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3. Glory to God. Proverbs chapter 3, and we're going to read verse 33. I'd like to ask you to read it with me. Ready? Read. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesseth the habitation of the just. Anybody glad to be the just in this place? Glad that God blesses our homes. Amen. Amen. This morning, we're continuing this series we've been studying entitled, Get Out of My House. We've been telling recession to get out of our houses. We've established the fact that there are many who have been successful in recession-proofing their houses. They've done what the Word of God says so that although recession has ravished the world around them, it has not gotten into their houses, had no real impact on their financial lives. But there are also many who weren't successful in recession proof in their houses. There are many who found that recession has invaded their home. And so they have experienced job loss. They've seen their savings dwindle. They've lost houses. Or maybe they found that the value of their house is actually less than what they owe on their house. Many are still just hanging on hoping that the economy would turn around. Many are in a very tough spot because the curse found a way into their house and produced recession in their life. But we found out last Sunday that God is a God who can take you from financial ruin to a place of financial prosperity if you will use your faith and authority in him. And we found that that begins by taking a stand of faith. By putting our foot down and saying, that's enough. I'm having no more. Recession, get out of my house. And saying, blessings, come on into my house. And we know that as we do those things, God will back us up. Anybody glad about that? Glory to God. Well, Wednesday, we continued with this. And we uh, began to look at seven steps to kicking recession out of your house. And I actually use these stairs as an example. And I, I'm going to do that again. Uh, if we were to pretend that the top of the, the steps or the stage is a place of financial prosperity and where I'm standing now, the floor is a place of financial ruin. You know, you've lost the things we've talked about. You're hurting, you're struggling. Well, we all understand that for me to get from here to there, I've got to go up the steps. And I'm not going to get up there by, without going up the steps. And the same thing is true spiritually. For you to get to a place where you are truly kicking recession out of your house and blessings have come in your house. For you to get to the place where you're actually standing, in, where you're actually enjoying your wealthy place, there are some steps you need to take. And you can't really skip any. You need to do them all. And so uh, Wednesday, we found that the first step that we need to take is to restore your faith in God. Restore your faith in God. We found that when you do not believe and say what God is saying about your financial situation, you miss the first step to financial prosperity in your life. And of course, you can't proceed to step two till you do step one. Everything in the kingdom of God is by faith. We found number two that you need to repent for where you missed it. And that's about as many amens we got on Wednesday too. <laughs> We learned the reason why so many don't have the blessing working in their lives is because they're actually not obeying the word of God. And what do you say? What do you mean, pastor? Uh, well, Proverbs 27, 23 says, you know, that we as, as individuals who are serving God ought to look well to our herds. Well, we don't have herds today. So how do we apply that to, to our lives today? Let's put it this way. Do what it takes to be financially healthy. See, sometimes we just expect to give and then, you know, the heavens to open and money just to come fall in our laps. And we, we forget that the blessing works through, as a result of our obedience. 
So we have to obey that scripture just as much as we have to obey, you know, love your enemies, any other scripture that we can think of. And when we refuse to tithe, we're not doing what it takes to be financially healthy. We're not giving offering. We're not doing what it takes to be financially healthy. When we don't have a budget, we're not doing what it takes to be financially healthy. Oh, it's getting quiet in this place. Amen. When we're living above our means, we're not doing what it takes to be financially healthy. We don't know what's coming in and what's going out. It's getting quiet. I'm telling you, I, 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 I'm, I'm thinking I need to stay right here and just preach this for the next. And we, we can go on and on and on. But the Bible bottom line is the reason why recession has gotten into the house of many of the just is because we left the door open. And the door that we left open was that we weren't faithful with the money God had already given to us. And the enemy took advantage of that and he brought ruin into our lives. So we have to repent of that, which not only means say I'm sorry, but to go in the opposite direction and now do what it takes to be financially healthy. Bishop has a series on this uh, called Managing the Family Business, I believe. So you can get a hold of that and that'll help you get on track there. And then number three, reinvest in the kingdom system reinvest in the kingdom system. The bottom line is many people have stopped tithing during this time. Many people have stopped giving during this time. Many maybe have just pulled back on their giving during this time. And when you stop giving like you were before, you are actually creating your own recession. Because we operate on a different system. Our system is seed time and harvest. So if I don't sow seed, I don't get harvest. Doesn't matter what time, what's going on in the economy, doesn't matter what's going on in the world around me, if I don't sow seed, I don't get harvest. If I do sow seed, I do get harvest. A lot of times people are saying, I'm claiming a hundredfold, but a hundredfold times zero equals zero. <laughs> Come on, anybody with me here in this place? And you still got to sow something for you to reap something. We talked about the woman in 1 Kings 17 who was uh, so poor she was about to prepare her last meal. Her and her son were about to eat that meal and die. The Bible says the man of God came to her. God had already commanded her to take care of him. So the man said, give me some water. And she, she went to get him water. He said, give me a little cake. And she says, look, I, I hardly have enough for one last meal. She became afraid. And, and, and the problem was she looked at what she had as harvest. He looked at what she had as seed. She was saying, this is all I have. He was saying, this is all, all you need. As long as you look at what you have as harvest, that is all you're going to have. But if you look at what you have as seed, then you have a truckload of harvest coming to you in your future. So if you're going to get to a place where you're able to kick recession out of your house and you're prospering again, you have to reinvest in the kingdom system. All right, well, go with me to Luke chapter 22. Let's get into what we're supposed to talk about today. Of course, if you weren't here on Wednesday, we encourage you to get the CD. It'll bless you. Somebody say, recession. recession. Get out of my house. Get out of my house. That was kind of weak. <laughs> Somebody say it again. Say, recession. recession. Get, out get out of my house. Not in my house. <laughs> Luke chapter 22, number four step that we need to take. We talked about number one, number two, number three. Number four is to race to your place. Somebody turn to him and tell him, race, race to your place. Here in Luke chapter 22, Jesus is speaking to his apostles. And in verse 35, it says, he said to them, when I, I sent you. There's a difference between being sent and being someone who just went. Oh, let me keep moving. Sometimes folk just went and then we go went with them. Oh, glory. Let me be good. When I sent you, Without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked you anything. What's he talking about? In Luke chapter 9, Jesus called to him the 12. He, he gave them power and authority. He sent them to go preach the gospel in, in numerous cities. And he told them to go without purse, which, of course, 
you know, for women, we understand that still. Today, as purse for, for men, we would say, without a wallet. So he told them to go without money. He told them to go without scrip. Well, scrip is what they would use to hold their food. So think of a lunch box. He told them to go without food. And he told them to go without shoes. Now, I don't know about you, but if the Lord told me today, hey, I, I want you to go to Hawaii and preach the gospel to the cities of Hawaii. Well, I'm like, yes, Lord, I, I hear that. I receive that, Lord. I'll do that. I'll give you my I give my life away. I'll do that all the days of my life. But then if he were to say, but I don't want you to take any money, any food, I want you to go barefoot. I'd have some second thoughts. Anybody else? I mean, it's better to have some money and some food and some clothes in Michigan than, well, maybe some argue that, but you understand my point. Well, that's what Jesus told these guys to do. He's saying, I want you to go there without any money. Not that they didn't have money. He just said, go without it. He's trying to accomplish something here, a couple of things, I believe. Don't go, with, go without any food. Go without shoes. And he asked them here, he says, when I sent you, did you lack anything? Did you come up short of money? Any of these areas, did you, did you lack for money? Did you lack for food? Did you lack for clothing? And they said, not just one or two of them, all of them said nothing. So that tells me that when they walked into a city, Peter walked in a city, John or Matthew or whichever one you want to talk about, and they walked with no, had no money, no food, no clothes. They began preaching the gospel. God made sure money came to them. God made sure food was placed before them. God made sure shoes were put on their feet. God made sure they were well taken care of while they were carrying out his assignment. And see, that's the key phrase. While they were carrying out his assignment. When they were doing what he sent them to do versus what they decided to go and do, the provision was there. Now, they just went and did what they wanted to do. It would not have been there. It's like Peter going fishing after Jesus rose from the grave. Well, he goes fishing, and guess what he catches? Nothing. A lot of people are missing out on God's dream for their life because they're too busy chasing the American dream. And what's happening is when the American economy goes down, they go down with it. And when it goes up, they might go up with it. They may not. Part of the reason why recession is in a home of so many individuals is because they are not in their God-ordained place. They're not doing their God-given assignment. And just because you got a nice check coming in doesn't mean you're in God's assignment. And you find many of us have found out just in the last couple of years that that check can go away real fast. And that you better have God on your side, someone with you that can provide for you in other ways. In times like that. We'll go with me to 1 Kings chapter 17. Race to your place. I say race to it because time is short. We are in dangerous times. Many people have already been taken out during these times. And you need to get in your place. And you need to get in your place or get on track following God's plan for you right now. Time is up. No more playtime. No more, Lord, when I turn 30, when I turn 40, when I turn 50, when this happened, when that. No, no, no. You need to do it right now so God can use you and God can bless you. Amen. First Kings 17. We've already mentioned this story. We'll look at it a couple more times today, but I want you to notice this. There's a time of famine. And really, we could start with verse no, let's go to verse, verse, verse 8. It says, The word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Sidon, and dwell where? Dwell where? There. there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman where? There. there to sustain thee. Now, remember, if you were to read verse 7, that the Bible said the brook dried up. He's thirsty. God says, Now, there's a widow woman, but she's in Zarephath. Zarephath is where I want you to be. When you get there, she'll provide for you. When you get there, you'll be taken care of. Now, if we were to back up a few scriptures, we know that he got to the brook because God gave him instruction. 
God told him, he said, listen, I want you to go by the brook Cherith, and I've com- you'll drink of the brook, and I've commanded ravens to feed thee there. So if he had decided not to go there, then there would have been a brook there waiting for someone to drink of it and piles of food sitting there waiting for him, and he'd have been starving somewhere else. But because he was willing to go there, he ate good during the time of, 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 of famine. He drank good during the time of famine. And because when God said, now switch locations, he didn't die over there by a dry brook because he was waiting around arguing with God. He got up and he went to that brook. He needed to race to his place so he can eat. See, we're serious when it comes to food. I mean, he, he's got to move now to get there. I, I saw one, one individual mention that it may have taken him six days to get there. Okay, but he, he's racing to his place so that God can use him, which God did, and God could take care of him. So many times Christians are, 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 are standing by the sink. They've turned the water on in the shower. The water is far pouring, and they're sitting there going, why am I not getting wet? Get in the shower. When you get under the spout where the glory comes out. When you get in that place God's called you to be in. When you get in that job God's called you to be at. When you join that church God's told you to join. When you're obeying God's direction for your life, that's when you'll find that provision is there. Provision is in the vision. So you need to find out God's vision, and then you need to go ahead and do what he said. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Race to your place. It's a big part of the problem. God made you a painter and you decided to be a musician. God made you a teacher you decided to be a preacher. Come on now. You understand what I'm trying to say here. God made you a musician and you decided to be a lawyer. The money's better. Oh, God needs you where he calls you to be. People need you. This is far bigger than money. We just happen to be talking about money today. People need you where God has placed you. And that's where your money is. You got some ravens sitting there right now. They dropping food off. Dropping it off. And some of us, they've been dropping it off for a long time. But the good news is if you go ahead and get to your place, you can enjoy what God has provided for you. Deuteronomy chapter 1. I want you to notice something God did for, it, for, for Israel. Moses is talking to them about, about some things and talking about their time that they went through the wilderness and, and they were headed to the promised land. It says in verse 32, Yet in this thing, you did not believe the Lord your God, who went in the way before you, get this, to search you out a place to pitch your tents in. You see that? God actually went ahead of them to prepare a place for them where they would be able to rest, they would be able to, to eat, they would be able to continue on the journey, be prosper in this journey that God had for them. God already prepared a place for you. There's a promised land for you. And when you get to that promised land, then you find God blesses you. You're a blessing. God will make your name great. And, and, and you shall people be blessed. Well, go with me to Joshua chapter 2. Now, for some, the issue here is just it is plain old fear. Usually what it takes to get to the place God has for you is faith. Meaning that God is asking you to leave something or do something that your head is saying you shouldn't leave or do. And you need to go ahead and just step out believing that God will be there. God will use you and on and on and on. And and so we allow fear to keep us from what we're asking God for, what we need God to provide for us. Kind of like that. That's why the prophet of God said in 1 Kings 17 to that woman, he said, fear not. Then he told her what to do. Well, you know, Israel had the same problem. When they got to the promised land, right at the border, God told Moses to send in 12 spies. Anybody remember that story? Okay. The Bible says that 10 of those spies came back with a bad report. Their bad report was that we cannot take this land. There are giants in this land. There are great, strong cities in this land. We can't take this land. In our own sight, we're like grasshoppers. They were afraid. They cried all night, and because of their fear, God said, you'll never go in, and their children went in because they got into faith. 
But what really gets my attention about this story is something that I came across here in, in Joshua chapter 2. This is during the time when they were going into the promised land. And Rahab, the harlot, shares this with the people of God. Verse 9, it says, She said unto the men, I know that the Lord have given you the land and that your terror is fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. Whoa, I thought they were fainting because of them. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. That was 40 years ago. What you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. That was 40 years ago. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. So frankly, all of this time, they, they were afraid of going in the land because they thought their enemies were too strong. And their enemies were afraid they would come in the land because they knew God was with them. If they had just shown up, it would have been over. They had just walked, just came over to Jordan. That would have been it. Folk have been running. Oh, my gosh, here they are. And I'm sure they were wondering what's taking them so long because they could see what they could do. Well, for many of us, you know, the enemy has gotten us afraid of stepping into what God has called us to do. But what we don't realize is that he is shaking in his boots. He's the one that's afraid that we'll step into what God has called us to do and we'll get out of recession. We'll get to a place of prosperity and God will use us to save the world around us. We need to make a decision to say, you know what? I'm racing to my place. I'm going to go where God said to go. I'm going to do what God said to do. And I believe God's going to bless me in that. Amen. And that's a master key to kicking recession out of your house. Hallelujah. Well, go, go back with me to 1 Kings chapter 17. I like the story in 1 Samuel 10 about when, uh, when Saul was anointed to be king. Samuel, the, pro the prophet, you know, poured oil on him and then told him a number of signs that would happen to him, proving to him that he was to be king of Israel. But also, they happened after that he, he got the grace to be in his place. And so he, 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 the Bible teaches that, you know, he, he came, the man of God said he would come across two men that would say, the donkeys you lost will be, have been found. So he received restoration. Yes, then he said he'll, he'll come across some other men going up to worship. They'll have, you know, loaves of, of bread and other things. They'll salute you and they'll bless you. So that's what he got. He had favor and he received provision. Yes. Then he said, you'll come across the company of prophets. They'll be prophesying. The anointing will come on you. You'll start to prophesy. And that's what happened. He began to prophesy. He had some spiritual progress in his life. And then finally he said, you will be turned into another man and saw it had a change of status in his life so many of us you've already got the grace and if you'll just step into your place you'll find there's your restoration you'll find there's your favor there's your provision there's your progress in god and there is your change of status Hallelujah. you know i was listening to a, a message by, uh, by brother copeland just a couple days ago just in my car it was from uh, the southwest believers convention and he was talking about this very issue. And he was talking about how, you know, he is called to be a teacher and a prophet. And that if he had elected to just stay a pilot, because that's what he used to do, and he still gets to fly. But that's what he was. Just been a marginal Christian and just was, uh, was a pilot. That one day he would have gotten to heaven and he would have had to stand before a portrait that God had of him. And the portrait would be of him as a prophet and a teacher. And he would have to answer to God for why he was not that portrait. What's your portrait look like? It's when you start looking like that portrait is when the provision comes. It's when you start looking like that portrait when you fully please God and God can use you the most to help change the world around you. Well, next thing. First Kings 17, number five. Receive heaven's instructions. Receive heaven's instructions. First Kings 17, we just finished reading some of this. But let's read verse 1. It reads, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was in, of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, 
There shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. That's some confidence right there. And the word of the Lord came to him. I don't want you to miss this. This famine is going to be so bad. It's going to be terrible because not only will there be no rain, there'll be no dew. There'll be no moisture at all. So you're talking about just as, as really as bad as it can get. So after God uses this man to declare this to the wicked king, then the word of the Lord comes to the man. A message from God, orders from heaven, specific orders. I want you to notice that this word of the Lord came to him and it was entirely about provision. It was all about making sure the man was provided for. And I know some people struggle with that. They don't think this topic is very spiritual. You know, I told you last week what I call that, spooky. Because <laughs> it's all over the Bible. Amen. And if it's in the Bible, it's spiritual. Yes. Well, God spoke to this man to make sure his man was provided for. So he gave him the instructions we just finished mentioning. He said, go by the brook Cherith and you'll, you'll drink of that brook and I have ravens feed you dirty birds. That's the wealth of the sinner right there. <laughs> feed you there. And, and of course, that's what happened that God provided in that way. And then he jumped down to verse seven. It says, and it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up. Well, man, I thought he was in the will of God. He was where God told him to be. Yeah, he was. But the book, brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Sometimes natural circumstances will impact what God can use to get it to you. But it doesn't change the fact that God's going to get it to you. So God just had to switch up here. He had to change channels. Instead of using this brook and some ravens, now he's going to use a widow woman in Zarephath. And notice so what happens. The word of the Lord came to him saying, arise, get to Zarephath. There's a widow woman there. And we know that he did what God said. And the widow, wasn't, widow woman was not the only one that ate for all those days. Her son wasn't the only one that ate for all those days. But the prophet ate for all of those days. Because he heard the word of the Lord. Notice that he ran out of water and God didn't just immediately give him water. He didn't give him water. He gave him a word. See, God doesn't always just directly meet the need. Many times what he does, he gives instruction. And as you obey the instruction, then the blessings follow that obedience. And that's what happened here. You think about uh, in John chapter 2, there was a, a wedding. Jo Jesus, his mother, Mary, was the wedding coordinator, it seems. They ran out of wine. She turns to the servant. She says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. He tells them, okay, I want you to fill these water pots up with water, draw it out, bring it, to, bring it to the governor of the feast. Well, that sounds crazy. We need wine, and you want me to put water in these pots and, and then act like it's wine. But for some reason... They chose to do what she said. Mary must have been something, quite a person for them to have that kind of faith in her. They didn't really know Jesus. But they, they did what he, what he said, and the Bible says that water was turned to wine. Well, the, you know, Jesus brought, he gave instruction. And when they followed that instruction is when that water came. How about Peter when Jesus used his boat? Peter had been fishing all day, caught nothing. But after Jesus got done preaching, he said, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. Peter, of course, argued with him for a moment, but went ahead and did what he said. And he received a boat sinking harvest. A lot of times we're saying, God, I need this money for this purpose. God, where's my harvest for that? God, can you come through in this area? And we're looking for some cash. We're looking for a check. And what God gives us a word. And if we just obey that word, then we'll find the cash. We'll come across the check. We'll have the increase. But you got to obey that word. What has he said to you? See, God doesn't always do things the way you want it done. Anybody figured it out yet? I mean, he loves us. We have a covenant with him, but he's still in charge. 
His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. The, the wisdom of men doesn't compare to the foolishness of God. So if God, God wants to do it a certain way, you got one or two choices. You can work against that and get nothing or work with that and watch God use you and bless you. And one of the ways that he does it unquestionably is by telling you, giving you an instruction to follow. And when you follow that instruction, it brings about great success in your life. Go with me to Psalm 91. The instruction you obey is the future you create. No obedience means no provision. Obedience means provision. So what do I do when I'm in financial trouble? What do I do when I need God to move on my behalf? Well, we know you, you, know you return the tithe. We know you give the offering. We'll talk about some other things that you do in the workplace. But here's something else that you always should do, and you, and you definitely should do when you're in a time of trouble. James chapter 1 and verse 5. You look at the context here, it's talking about being in a time of trouble. What did I say, Psalm? Psalm. I'm sorry, go to James, go to James. We can look at Psalm too, but go to James. James chapter 1 and verse 5 says this. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, you don't know what to do. I mean, sometimes we don't know what to do. You can have multiple degrees and decades of experience and have a situation come, come, come into your life and you really don't know what to do to get the God kind of results you want. He said, if you lack wisdom, what do we do? Let him ask of God. God give it to all men liberally and upbraid if not. He's not playing hide and seek. Okay? He's someone who gives freely, and, and, and you'll see what I mean by that. It shall be given him. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. So if you ask of God, God's the kind of God that'll give you wisdom. God wants you to have it. God wants you to know he has a plan for your life. He has a plan for your finances. But you need to call on him. That's what Psalm 91 says. It says, he will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. Anybody glad God will be with you in trouble? I mean, I know it's good that he's with me when things are going good, but I really need him with me when I am in trouble. He said, I'll be with him in trouble. But see, the key here then is, is, is you got to call. And many people don't seemingly hear from God, not because God's not speaking, but because they don't take the time to call. They don't take the time to seek him. Your part is to call. His part is to answer. So if you're not sure what to do, you're not sure how to handle something, you need to get on your face before God and get wisdom from God. And you know that in that direction is the provision for, to receive what God wants you to have. Amen. Well, go maybe with a Proverbs chapter 13. Talking about how to kick recession out of your house. Hopefully once and for all. You do these things we're talking about, you'll not only kick it out of your house, you'll be recession proof. And when the next one comes, you'll be positioned to help people instead of just trying to get help. And that's really the will of God, you know. Number six, reclaim your wealth God's way. Reclaim your wealth God's way. Verse 22, a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. And the wealth, didn't say the money. There's a difference between money and wealth. You know, money is money and wealth is a lot of money. <laughs> said the wealth of the sinner, that person who's not serving God, is laid up for the just. Anybody would say, I'm the just. If yeah, you receive Jesus, Lord, of your life, you're living that way. You're a part of the just. Well, notice here, a good man keeps his inheritance. It goes to his kids. An evil man loses his inheritance. It goes to the good man. I don't think you heard what I just said. In fact, notice how he said that the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. It's reserved. It's on layaway. Anybody remember layaway? 
I remember growing up, my mother going, we go to TJ Maxx or something way back when, and she'd go get some stuff and put it up on layaway. And I, I didn't necessarily know what that was, but I did know that we would come back later to get it. <laughs> well, there's some wealth sitting up on layaway for us, the wealth of the sinner. We know they've got wealth beyond what you can imagine, and they're using it, even if they don't realize it, to help finance Satan's mission to send as many people to hell as possible and to cause as many to suffer in this earth as possible. They've got millions and, and billions and trillions, and God says it's actually laid up for us, the just. So what's the problem? Why isn't it in my hands? Because you got to claim it. You got to come back to the layaway window with your ticket of faith and say, I want my harvest and receive it in Jesus' name. Come on, go to chapter 28. Let me just prove this to you from Scripture. Yeah, they're using it to put out horror movies that are just plain demonic. You could have been using it to put out a movie that will bless people and help them to see the truth about Jesus. They're using it to finance candidates that stand for things that are completely contrary to God's word. You could have been using it to make sure a man or woman of God, a real one, was in office. I mean, come on, they're using it, to, they're using it for all kinds of things, and God needs to get it to you so he can get his will done in the earth. Come on, Proverbs 28, verse 8. He that by usury and unjust gain, in other words, he's getting his money in crooked ways, increases his substance. He will gather it for him that will pity the poor. Oh, I don't know if you just saw what we just read there. Yeah, he's going out working hard, and he's, he's, he's cheating and lying and stealing, and he's doing all this so he can have money. He doesn't know he's working for you. Amen. Come on, go to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. It's not that you like what he's doing, but what he's gonna, the, the cost of his actions is that he's going to lose what he had. And it's not that we're after the sinner's money because we just want their money. We want to take the wealth of the world to reach the world. We realize we're going to need that money to get, go ahead and get this gospel message out in every arena so we can get the attention of everybody because not everybody's coming through the doors of that church, of this church. Not everybody's going to walk in on Sunday morning just in and of themselves. you got to reach them with the gospel, not only in how we live it in the workplace, but in all these others are, other arenas that God has placed in this world, and that takes money. Amen. Frankly, it takes money to even have church in a place like this. God needs to get it to you so he can get it through you so we can reach them. Ecclesiastes 2, verse 26. For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight, wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he giveth travail. He gives work to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. Oh, that's at least the third time I've seen that in Scripture. Go to Job chapter 27. Come on, come on, come on. Some of you, you you're getting it. Some of you are looking at me like, I, I don't know about that. Well, you don't know about it in a minute. Glory to God. You need, you need to recognize it's yours before you'll claim it. Because you got to understand, when God blesses you financially, he's not going to do it by just dropping dollars from heaven. There are no counterfeit machines in heaven. There are no angels up in there you know, making some counterfeit money. No, God's going to use the money in this system. So he's got to rotate it. He's got to move it out of the hands of the just or the wicked and bring it into the hands of the just. He's got to circulate this thing. See, the wealth of the sinner and the harvest of the just are the same thing. Go on, Luke 6, 38 says, Give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over shell. Did it say Christian men? Maybe Christian men sometimes, but also it may be unchristian men. Well, give into your bosom. I believe, and if I'm wrong on this, you have to forgive me, but I, I've seen and remembered that a mountain lion and a panther are actually the same thing. We just use different terms for it. Wealth of the sinner and harvest of the just are actually the same thing. So if you're going to receive harvest, realize it's come out of the hands of somebody. That's right. Somebody. That actually, their judgment is that they'll lose it. And hopefully you'll use it so that you can reach them with the gospel. Job 27, verse 13. 
This is the portion of a wicked man with God. We jump down to verse 16. It says, though he heap up silver as the dust and prepare raiment as the clay, he may prepare it, but the just shall put it on. Woo! Silver as the dust and the innocent shall divide the silver. Oh, somebody said, I need some New Testament on that. Go to Luke chapter 8. I can't give a better New Testament example than this. Yeah, the wealth of the sinner is laid up for you. It's on layaway. And you need to recognize that so you can claim it, do what it takes to reclaim it and get out of financial ruin and get to a place of prosperity. Luke chapter 8 and verse 1. Look at the ministry of Jesus. It says it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod Stewart, and Susanna, and many others which ministered to him of their substance. So notice they followed him everywhere they, he went. They were his partners. They were supporting his ministry. Notice again verse 3. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. Anybody remember Herod? He was not the just. Frankly, obviously, Chusa wasn't one of the just, or he'd have been following Jesus. So Joanna is taking Chusa's money, which, by the way, he's paid by Herod, and using it to finance Jesus' ministry. So the wealth of the sinner was coming into the hands of the just Jesus so the gospel could be preached in every city and every village and people could be born again and they could be healed. Yeah. Now, the, if the wealth of the sinner found his way to Jesus and I'm a child of God, I'm a son of God because of him, I know it can find its way to me and I believe I need to do, I'm going to do my part to reclaim that wealth. Yeah. Go me to Genesis 26. How do I reclaim it? How does God get that money to me? How does he circulate it? Out of the hands of the, of the wicked into the hands of the just. Genesis 26, verse 12. Then Isaac sold in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Well, there are three ways that we get harvest. The first is unexpected income. Amen. You know, that's Luke 6, 38. Men, a give to you. You know, somebody ever, ever get a holy handshake? You know, somebody, as we call it sometimes, somebody come and God bless you, and in their hand is $20 or $100, and, and they're blessing you with it. That's unexpected income. Anybody ever have unexpected income? Amen. You didn't earn it. You didn't plan for it. God got it to you. Yeah. Amen. The second way we've kind of already talked about through God ideas. God gives you instruction. Hallelujah. And, you know, like in Matthew chapter, I believe, 17, a couple of tax collectors come and they want, they want Jesus' taxes. So Peter comes and tells Jesus what's going on. Jesus says, go to the sea, cast a hook in the water, grab up the first fish that comes up, open his mouth, and in it you'll find a piece of money that will pay for you and mine and your taxes. Well, you know, there was instruction. When he followed the instruction, he found money in one of the strangest places you could find it. In the mouth of a fish, enough money to pay for taxes, the taxes of two preachers. In Scripture, you find individuals who got inventions from God. You know, Jacob had an invention from God. when He, he had an agreement with Laban. All the spotted and speckled sheep and, and otherwise, they'll belong to me. Those that are not, they belong to you. So what does he do? He creates some rods lays them in front of those, those sheep and those animals whenever they drink and whenever they mate. And the result of that is their, their, their offspring are born, with, are speckled and spotted. Now, come on, we in a day and age, people still can't figure out how to make sure you have a boy when you want a boy. <laughs> Believe me, if they did, I'd have had a boy. <laughs> no, I love my girl, don't get me wrong. But this guy, thousands of years ago, takes a little rod and lays it out, and all of a sudden it makes him wealthy. Well, that was, God told him it was because Laban had been stealing from him all these years. God was taking the wealth of the sinner and putting it into the hands of him, the just, 
and to use the God idea to do that. So when God gives you an invention, God gives you an instruction, you have to follow through on those things. And when God gives you an invention, don't do it the old Christian way. What I'm talking about, you know, you used to go to a bookstore and if it was a Christian bookstore, you knew it'd be run down. Come on now, I grew up in the church. Don't look at me. You know what I'm talking about. If a Christian does it, it's not done right. You want it done right, go find a sinner. Y'all, don't look at me like that. You know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> don't have do anything because you expect God to make up the difference. God expects you to give your 100%. Then he'll add his blessing to your 100% and you'll have the increase that he promised. But here's the third way, and that's the reason why I read this scripture. Isaac was told by God to stay in that land. And then he got up and sold in that land. Sometimes we look at this and we think he was given. No, Isaac got up. Today we say he brushed his teeth, washed his face, took a shower, put on his work clothes and went to work. He's sowing seed. That's what he does. God blesses what he put his hands to. And he becomes so rich that the king says, you need to leave us. Number three way, and the main way God gets money to us is through our jobs or careers. Amen. Now, this is something that's been missing in the minds of, of believers sometimes, because sometimes this is why people criticize the prosperity message, this, this particular thing. Because somehow or another, Christians miss this point. They just think I throw something in the bucket and God's going, no, 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 no. Yeah, it starts with throwing something in the bucket. But there are ways God gets harvest to you. And you can't throw something in the bucket and then be late to work. Half doing things, gossiping during work time, reading your Bible when you're supposed to be working. Read your Bible, but read it when you're supposed to read it. Don't steal from your employer. Don't really care about their job, but just a little something I do to have a little money so I can get to work. No, your job is a part of your ministry. And if you get in a job God called you to be in, you love it, you'd enjoy it, and God will promote you more and more and more till you are the CFO and the CEO and that person who has great influence, and God will use that to bring wealth into your life. Even if you're in a low job right now, look at the story of Joseph. He was a slave in, 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 a, in a foreign land, but because God's blessing was on him and he was diligent, he obviously swept the best floors. And did the best cleaning because the master said, God's on this man. I can't have him in this position. I can't afford to have him down here. Let me make him be the boss over this house. Then he ran the house so well, the man said, my goodness, God's on him. I need to go ahead and let him run the money of this house. This isn't a little money. This is the captain of the army. He's loaded. You understand? Then he's so annoyed. He does such a good job there that the man treats him like he is his son. Means he gets to enjoy whatever he wants except for the man's wife. That's where the problem came in. She wanted him to enjoy her too. <laughs> My point is that that work ethic took him from a low slave to the head slave, eventually from the low prisoner to the head prisoner, and eventually from head prisoner to number two in an entire country because he took because he he made sure that his hands, whatever his hands went unto, he was diligent in it, and then God prospered him. See, we have an advantage they don't have out there. We've got the blessing of the Lord. We've got God blessing everything we put our hands unto. We can have success every single time, and that is the main way God's gonna get your money to you. All right, last thing, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I wish I had more time for that, but we're going to keep on moving. You all still with me? You getting anything out of this? All right, we've learned a few things, but now let's go to the last step. I get this last thing after everything else. This is going to take me to a place where a recession is out of my house. And blessings are flowing in my house. So number seven, return to your purpose. Hallelujah. Return to your purpose. Before I read this scripture, I want to read a story to you. I think you'll like this. The pastor of a church that didn't have the reputation for being very generous with their giving decided it was time to do something drastic in order to reach the con teach the congregation the importance of giving. So he contacted an electrician and had all of the pews wired. 
The next Sunday, which was the first Sunday of the new year, the time when the church had traditionally taken up pledges from the people, the pastor stood up and made the following announcement. From now on, instead of putting your pledges in sealed envelopes and turning them into the church office, all pledges will be made publicly during the worship service. Then he said, so let's get started. All of you who have pledged to give $10 a week, please stand up. As soon as he said this, he pushed a button that the electrician had installed in the pulpit <laughs> and it sent a jolt of electricity through the wires and into the pews. Immediately, about one half of the congregation jumped to their feet. <laughs> the pastor reached down and adjusted a knob on the podium and then said, all of you who have pledged to give $20 a week, please stand. A second stronger vote of electricity <laughs> caused several more people to rise to their feet. This whole process was repeated several times. Each time the pledge amount was raised along with the voltage. The ushers had to work fast just to record all of the names and pledges. <laughs> After the service, the pastor and his staff were busy adding up the totals and congratulating themselves on the great success of the annual stewardship campaign. Their enthusiasm ended abruptly, however, when one of the deacons opened the door and announced that four church members had been electrocuted because they refused to stand up. Some people won't give for any reason. <laughs> Come on, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 8. Here's the big problem. People have forgotten the purpose. Why is God bringing money into your life? Is it just so you can have your needs taken care of? Is it just so you can have your desires, the house you want, the car you want, the clothes you want? I and mean, we know the Bible teaches God wants us to enjoy life. But is there, are there, a, higher, is there a higher purpose than that? Can, can your money impact someone else's eternity? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. Paul's talking about what will happen if we give bountifully and cheerfully. It says, and God is able. Thank God he's able. God is able to make all grace, that's talking about the blessing, abound toward you. So grace bounces toward you. It comes on you in abundance. Why would he give you the blessing? Because it make it rich? That's part of the story. That you always having all sufficiency in all things. Well, man, that's, that's something to shout about right there. Always having, not only, that word sufficiency doesn't mean need. It means self-satisfaction. And all things and every, so you being abundantly blessed. But notice that's not the end of the scripture. Now, if we're not careful, that's how we read it. God has called our grace abound towards you, and you'll always have all sufficiency in all things. But actually, if you notice the punctuation in the scripture, you'll find that after the word about, after the word you, where it says abound towards you, there's a semicolon. After the, uh, the word things, there's a, there's a comma. So actually, I can take that phrase, always having all sufficiency in all things, out of the scripture and still get the meaning of the scripture. God will cause all grace to abound towards you that you may abound. You are abounding. You're jumping towards. You're, you're giving bountifully to every good work. And notice, it's not a good work if it's not a God work. Sometimes we give the good works, but it's not helping anybody see anything about Jesus. It's not building the kingdom of God at all. No, he wants you to abound to every good work. So what he's telling you is how he'll get it to you so he can get it through you. He wants you to get it so you can give it. Look at verse 11. It says, being enriched, made rich. What that means. And everything. Why? To all bountifulness. The Amplified Bible says, so you can be generous. So once again, you see the purpose. He wants to get it to you so he can get it through you. It's like breathing. You've got to inhale for you to exhale. And God wants you to inhale it and exhale it. Get it to give it. Get it to give it. Get it to give it. If all you do is inhale and you never exhale, you got a problem. And if that's how you are in life, you're the, the wicked rich man. 
You're the hoarder, the Bible talks about. You're the one that will see your possessions end up in the hands of somebody who understands the purpose. That I get it to give it. I get it to give, to give it. I get it to give it. Let's see, it's getting quiet in this place. Because sometimes we think, well, I can't do that until I get to a certain level. No, 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 no. That's the purpose of the Mondays in your life right now. So you get it to give it. And while you give it, you're sowing. God blesses you with more. Then you're able to give more. God blesses you with more. You're able to give more. That's how this process works. But, but, but remember, you are a giver, not a taker. Your life, the Bible says you're called to be a blessing, not just called to be blessed. You ought to be looking to be a blessing and not always looking for a blessing. Amen. And it's not until you understand that where you get the fullness of what God has for you. You know, uh, that Jesus said, and Paul talked about it in Acts chapter 20. He said it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And, and I came across a study that was done where 19 healthy volunteers were asked to play a computer game while their brains were scanned. And this is deep. The game not only gave out cash rewards, but it asked for donations to charity. So they wanted to see how your brain responded. So when people received the cash rewards, the pleasure part of the brain lit up. No surprise. Come on, anybody understand that? That didn't surprise them. What did surprise them is that when people gave donations, that pleasure part of the brain actually lit up more than when they received cash. Did you hear what I just said? Not only that, but there was another part of the brain that lit up as well because they had an emotional connection to the donation that they were giving. So it is actually a physical fact that it is better to give than it is to receive. You actually enjoy giving more than you enjoy receiving. Now, clearly, this is a learned response because kids don't naturally do it, but it's an, it's an acquired taste. But the more you do it, the more you realize how much you enjoy it. And eventually you'll figure out that being someone who lives to give versus living to get is living on a higher level than everyone else, that I'm enjoying the life God really wanted me to have. And it's not just me enjoying being blessed, although that's part of it, but there's a higher level of joy than that available to me, the joy of being a blessing. We got to remember our purpose and we got to remember what the Bible talks about in Isaiah 58. What does God want us to do? He wants us to clothe those that have no clothes. Amen. He wants us to give hung food to the hungry. He wants us to give drink to the thirsty. He wants us to be a blessing to the poor. And he wants us to finance the gospel message. Go to Exodus chapter 30, 25. You know, Lord helped me change my confession a couple of years ago. I used to confess, you know, thanking God that I'm a God made millionaire and thank God for that. But he took me a step farther. One day he showed me what I need to confess. I'm believing God that I will be able to give a million dollars a year. I'm not just believing to get a million dollars a year. That's not really what my life's about. I'm believing to be able to give a million. I want every year to be able to pay off a couple of people's houses and send a couple of kids to Christian school. And Come on now. That's a different mindset there. I want to give a million a year. There's nothing better you can give somebody than to help them see the truth about Jesus. Exodus 25, verse 2. The Lord speaking to Moses, he said, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring who? Me an offering. God considers it an offering for him. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. Now, so he knows he's telling the man of God to take an offering. Some folk got a problem with that. Why are they taking up an offering? You think you're speaking against that man. You better be careful. You might be speaking against God. That man may not want to take that offering because he knows you're going to talk about him. I mean, how do you think Elijah felt going to a widow woman in a time of famine? But he's got to obey God's instructions too. He's telling them, he's telling them, you tell them take an offering for me. He goes on to tell them what the offering should be. And then verse 8, he says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Well, today we don't have to build God one sanctuary. 
although we do for places we can have services like this. But what is God's real sanctuary? Right. It, it, greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. The Bible says that our bodies are the temple of the living God. So every time someone receives Jesus as Lord of their life, God just received another sanctuary. So when I'm giving so that people can hear the gospel, I'm making him a sanctuary. And we ought to be like God. God so loved that he gave. But a lot of times we stop there. But he so loved that he gave so whosoever could have everlasting life. He loved us enough that he gave to us his best gift so that we could have eternal life. We ought to follow his example and love people so much that we give what the Bible tells us to give and God speaks to our hearts to give so that other people can have eternal life. The bottom line is you are here today. Many of us are saved today because somebody gave yesterday. It's time we pay it forward. It's time we go ahead and give like the word of God tells us to give so that other people can hear the gospel message and God's will on the earth can be fully accomplished. Now I want to draw your attention to the screens for a moment. I have a video for you. So always remember the purpose.